well. Okay, so uh, everyone, welcome uh, to this uh, seminar presentation by uh, uh, Dr. Jeff Morgan. Uh, before most of you got on, um, uh, Mark, is, Mark was sharing with me that it's 78 degrees in Cape Town where Jeff is right now. And so you know what it's like here on the East Coast and it's not quite so nice. I first met Jeff in 1999. There was a conference uh, honoring a, a great uh, South African uh, nuclear physicist by the name, by the name of Friedel Selshock. And Friedel had a fest at his 70th, I believe it was. Uh, and the, one of the unique things about Friedel is he had been of service to both the apartheid regime and the post-apartheid regime. So, you know, he was really someone who made a contribution to the evolution of the country. And so anyhow, let me tell you about Jeff. So Jeff was born in the town of Tangat, which is a small town in South Africa's Northeast coast in 1976. And he grew up there. Uh, in 1994, uh, when South Africa had, had its first uh, democratic elections, he moved to Cape Town to commence undergraduate studies at UCT. Uh, he com on completion of his BS uh, degree, majoring in both applied math and physics, he earned, uh, he obtained a first class honors degree with a specialization in mathematical physics, also at UCT. This was followed by an MS award. Uh, and in 2000, he was awarded the Lynn Berry Fellowship to pursue a PhD jointly at UCT and Worcester College, Oxford, and, uh, Oxford University under the supervision of George Ellis and Philip Candelas. Uh, after receiving a PhD for his work on non commutative geometry and string theory, he began work as a postdoctoral fellow in the high energy theory group at Brown University. So we, so this is a return for Jeff and specializing in gauge theory uh, and gauge, I'm sorry, gauge theory, gravity correspondence. He returned to a faculty uh, member at UCT in 2006. So with no further ado, Jeff, I'm going to turn um, the action over to you and I'm gonna mute myself. So you have it. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you for the introduction. It's, it's, it's really wonderful to um, speak at Brown. And, um, and I'm only sad that I'm not able to be there in person. Um, <clears throat> I, I do rather love coming back to Brown and it's quite an honor to be asked to speak at the, um, at the departmental colloquium. Um, so I, I need to thank uh, in particular Marcus uh, for the invitation. Um, so let me start sharing my screen. And um, I can take it from there. So it's not clear what you're, what are you seeing at the moment? Correct answer. <laughs> Looks good. Okay, great, excellent, fantastic. Um, I just wanna move the Zoom stuff down to the bottom of the screen and then I can have uninterrupted access to my screen. Super. Um, okay, so, um, <clears throat> so uh, again, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I want to talk today about some work that's not entirely string theory, but it's not unrelated. Um, and it's, it's work that I started thinking about um, during some long distance flights uh, between South Africa and, 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 um, and the UK. And uh, to be honest, all flights in and out of South Africa are long distance flights. So you get a lot of time to think on planes. Um, and I don't sleep very well on planes, so I got a chance to read an interesting article by somebody that used to be a Google engineer. And <clears throat> um, he wrote this article about how um, the scientific paper, as we're, as we're used to it, is an archaic thing of the past. And I was very interested in what he meant by this, um, so I started to read the article a little bit further. Uh, actually, sorry, I'm just, Zoom is blocking up some of the some of the stuff here. So I'm going to just quickly try and, okay. Uh, try that again. Okay. Right, great. So um, 
this was a this was an article about how the scientific paper was an archaic thing of the past and we need to move beyond that so i wanted to understand a little bit more about what was meant by this and um <clears throat> it turns out that the author meant that you know back in 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 the old days of academic publishing you you had a theory you solve some equations you put it down in a paper and the reader could read that paper and solve the equations um, by themselves and reproduce your work fairly quickly. Or if, for example, if you did an experiment, your data was reproducible in a small table, maybe in a couple of graphs. And again, it was something that was easily reproducible. Today, on the other hand, we live in a world where this is no longer the case. Most experiments are large experiments, which you know have moratorium on, on data sets. Um, Theoretical calculations often take months and sometimes years to reproduce, and very often this involves um, symbolic computing and, and large amounts of code to be written to, to reproduce this. So he says, so the author's um, uh, thesis is that what we, what we do have is, um, is interactivity with the internet. And so why not use that to better communicate our results? Um, so this was really an article about scientific communication. And to prove his point, the author took what he considers a, an exceptionally good written, uh, exceptionally well-written paper. And this, was a, this was a Nature article. It was a two and a half page Nature, nature article um, by Stephen Strogatz, who's an applied mathematician at Cornell, if for those of you who don't know him, and his then student, Duncan Watts. And Strogatz and Watts were studying synchronization um, and in doing so, they came up with a type of um, network problem, which they call small world networks. And it's a beautiful paper. It's a really masterfully written paper. And I, I you know, for the students in the audience, I, I, well, for the researchers in the audience as well, I heartily recommend you read the paper if you haven't. It's only two and a half pages and it's, it's but the author of this article considered this kind of, you know, this is close to the pinnacle of how you communicate science um, technical science to, to, to a broad audience as in nature. Um, and he showed how you could take this, this even well, you know, really well written paper and make it even better. And the way he made it even better was to make it interactive and communicate the idea. Um, my takeaway from this was really, this is a remarkable piece of science, um, is the Watts Strogatz network. And then I, I kind of got into network theory. Um, in, a, in a fairly big way, um, <clears throat> from, a, from a very selfish context of, uh, I had some problems in string theory that I was interested in, in studying, or, or at least the ADS-CFT correspondence. And in particular, um, at the time, I, well, still am, but um, was very interested in the SYK model, which many of you in the audience are, are familiar with. And so I wanted to, to understand aspects of the SYK model um, in a kind of universal way. And, found that the language of network theory really um, uh, contributed to, to this understanding. So what I want to talk about today is kind of the, the developments um, in the subject uh, from my own perspective um, in, in this direction. And it, uh, this is kind of um, related very much to the fact that we're all kind of confined to our home spaces and, and, and uh, uh, in the middle of a global pandemic. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, some related ideas that I've been playing around with um, about how viruses spread on, on, on networked systems. So this is work that I've been doing with um, a former student of mine, John Gabriel Hartman, um, who's now a PhD student in France, um, and Daria Rosa of the Institute for Complex Systems in Korea, and Jonathan Schock, who's, um, who's a, a faculty member in, in, in my group at uh, uh, the University of Cape Town. It's based largely on a, on a paper that we wrote in, in 2019, and some follow-up work, which uh, really ought to have come out last year, but for numerical reasons, um, we're still trying to get out, and hopefully will come out um, in, in March or so. Okay, so I'm not going to do an outline of the talk and I should apologize to the experts in the audience um, uh, to begin with, but um, I'm, I'm, given that this, is a, that this is a colloquium, I'm going to try and keep the, the talk at a pedagogical level as possible. 
Um, and so um, <clears throat> I'm happy to take questions. I can't see anyone asking any questions um, from my side of the screen. So I will I will take it as 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 they come. If they come at the end, then that's great. Um, <clears throat> but if anybody has any questions in the meantime, feel free to ask as well. Okay. So this talk is largely about something that we're going to call the small world phenomenon. And by small world phenomenon here, I mean really I look at the I look at the um, the participant list in the in the um, in in the Zoom room that we're in right now, and I sitting in 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 Cape Town. Um, uh, recognize a certain student in the audience, Luke Lipster, who's a student of Martha Spradlin, and I go, oh, small world, you were my student, you, you were a student at, at the University of Cape Town not so long ago. So that's what I mean by a small world. We seem to live in, an, in a highly interconnected um, world, and this is, this is more true now than probably ever before, um, and largely through large social networks um, made possible through the internet. <clears throat> um, Back in 1967, a researcher at Harvard um, decided to ask, a social scientist at Harvard, Stanley Milgram, decided to ask the question, how connected are we really? And so in attempting to quantify social connectivity in let's say the United States, they devised an experiment, Milgram and his team, um, devised an experiment um, that worked as follows. So the experiment was broken up into a couple of parts. The first part involved identifying some random individuals in let's say Nebraska, because it was in the middle of nowhere as far as they were concerned back then, um, <clears throat> and identifying a target individual in Boston, which is where they were, uh, where the research team was based. So they snail mailed the randomly identified individuals in Nebraska and asked them to send a letter to the target individual and the rules of the game were that you could only mail somebody that you knew, somebody in your own social network. Now, again, given that this is 1967, your social network was really defined by more or less the people that you knew and, and were acquainted with in a very short radius, unlike today, a short geographical radius. So they had to mail a letter to somebody that they knew with the same instructions that they ought to mail somebody that they knew with the aim of getting the letter to Boston, to this target individual in Boston. And they wanted to ask, uh, and at the same time, they had to, uh, they had to mail a postcard to Milgram's um, group at, um, in, in Boston, um, basically saying that they've completed the link. So they were trying to establish some chain of mails. <clears throat> so that's how they tracked the progress of the letter. And what they found was really remarkable. They found that essentially with a very small variance in this story, the letter reached the target by an average of about six mailings. So the social network exhibited what they were calling a small world phenomenon in the sense that complete strangers were connected by a very short acquaintance chain. And this connectivity was really mediated by a small number of highly connected study participants. So these were what they were calling hubs in this social network. If this sounds familiar, it's because this is what gave rise to the idea of six degrees of connectivity. That is in a network, in some social network where each node in the network, and I'll define these, these terms a little more precisely just now, but each node in this network um, <clears throat> represents an individual, say, and each link in the network represents the fact that they know each other um, that they're in each other's social network. And what they found was that you could go from A to B with six edges in this network or six degrees of connectivity between individuals in the network. And this is a really, really remarkable phenomenon, largely because of its universality. So here's a picture of the internet, as we know it today, classified by IP address. So this is the whole internet by IP address. So if you zoom into any one of these little um, uh, clusters down there, um, something that looks like a neural network, you see um, that there are IP addresses connected um, to some central IP address, which then sounds out throughout the entire network. So that's the internet. And it has that same kind of clustering structure that we see. Well, here is an example of why we're all sitting in our homes confined under lockdown because we're living in a, glo uh, in a global pandemic. These are flight routes that are centered on Europe. And what you're seeing here is 
precisely this kind of small world connectivity. The fact that you can get between any two points in the globe today with an average of two flights um, is testament to the fact that we live in a very connected small world, okay? But this isn't just a social phenomenon. This is a biological phenomenon as well. Here's a picture of the human brain. Um, the picture you're seeing on the left is what's called a, um, is an image generated by what's called diffusion tensor imaging. Um, <clears throat> so essentially measuring the connectivity of the, of the, of the brain. And um, researchers at the University of um, uh, Lausanne in Switzerland and um, Indiana um, have, have charted the brain in this way and found um, a similar small world type structure in the way the human brain processes um, information. That is to say, there are a small number of highly connected hubs in the brain. And instead of having a large network like you're seeing on the left, it, there's really a small network architecture in the human brain like you would see on the right. And the thesis is that this is one of the ways that the brain processes information so rapidly um, and allows it to maintain its um, structural integrity and, 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 and its efficiency over large computations. And for fun, here's a collaboration network. So this is a collaboration network of a particular researcher in the social sciences, but its overall structure is, is pretty much the same irrespective of, of um, which experience researcher you have um, uh, that you're executing this. So this would be related to, let's say, something like the Edish number um, uh, of people that um, wrote papers would, would, would call Edish. And it's quite um, appropriate that, that we talk about things like Edish numbers in this talk, because um, Paul Edish was one of the great contributors to, to graph theory or network theory. OK, so we're going to need to define some concepts um, a little more uh, rigorously, not too much so. Um, this isn't a graph theory talk, after all. Um, so I want, to, I want to just outline some of the uh, nomenclature we're going to need for the rest of the talk. Um, again, I beg apologies to anybody who's very familiar with this, and, and, and I think a lot of us in the audience would be, um, <clears throat> but it'll help set the stage for what I really want to talk about. So we're going to call a graph or a network um, some collection of vertices or nodes um, and edges or links, right? Um, <clears throat> in general, my, my, my graph or network will have n nodes and um, these will form some space, let's call it V, and edges that, um, that basically uh, connect to such nodes. And graphs have particular topology. Um, we can define things like distance on them. We can identify things like clusters in, in graphs. Um, there's notions of whether a node is central to the graph or whether it lies on the periphery, et cetera. So all of which will come into feature as we, as we progress. Um, and the edges are organized in a particular way that, that, um, that define the topology of the graph. So an organization could be regular, like a lattice, or it could be completely random, where I randomly connect a node to any particular other node. Um, and these random networks um, are, are well studied and well understood in mathematics, and they go by the name of edish rainy um, graphs. Um, the organization could be sparse um, or it could be dense. And what I mean by sparse and dense is what you would intuitively understand by the term. Um, if every node in the graph is connected to every other node, then we'll call the graph um, complete. If the graphs, if, the, if a node is, is connected to more than, um, if an edge connects more than, uh, sorry, if more than one nodes are connected um, together, then we, for, then we call the, the graph a hypergraph, for example. So the SYK model in this language is, a, is an all-to-all -all complete um, hypergraph. Um, and once we try and understand physical systems in this language, um, then there's a lot of mathematical machinery that we can bring to bear to the problem in a kind of universal way that doesn't really care about what the nature of the nodes are or the nature of the of the links. All it cares about is that you have these nodes and they interact with each other in a particular way. And those interactions can be coded in these edges. So networks have a number of properties. Um, for example, the degree of a node is the number of edges that, connect, that are connected to it. And we can calculate this degree 
um, by from something called the adjacency matrix. And the adjacency matrix basically tells you how nodes are connected. So essentially, um, it's a matrix um, whose entries are either one or zero um, for uh, an unweighted uh, for an unweighted network. Um, I'll talk about what the difference is just now. Um, but it's either one or zero, and it's one when two nodes i and j are connected by an edge, and it's zero when they're not. And this gives an unambiguous way of representing any simple network. By a simple network, I'll mean one that's not where the nodes don't have self connections or multiple connections and that kind of thing. Um, and it allows for a formulation of the network properties uh, in terms of linear algebra, essentially. So you can bring to bed all of the properties of all of the, the neat theorems that you know from linear algebra um, on such interacting uh, systems. So again, if I, if, I, if I give you the adjacency matrix to unambiguously characterize this um, system, you can go ahead and sum over all of the column entries and that'll give you, that'll count the number of edges connected to a particular node, let's say I, and give you the degree of that node, okay? I can generalize concepts that are quite familiar from our understanding of continuum calculus, like the Laplacian operator, um, to this discrete system. For example, I can write down a network Laplacian, which I'll call Lij, and the network Laplacian is the degree of the ith node when i equals j, or minus one when i is not equal to j, but i and j are edges, and it's zero otherwise. And you can show that this arises as a natural discretization of the continuum idea of the Laplacian. It's also related to the, to the adjacency matrix. Um, through um, Lij equal to Ki delta Ij minus um, Aij. And the network Laplacian is particularly useful if you want to partition networks. So for example, if, we calculate, if we're studying a quantum network as I'll define in a little bit, um, and we want to partition the network into two subsystems, so we want to study, let's say, the entanglement properties, um, the network Laplacian plays a central role in that. Um, <clears throat> And then there's the idea of the spectrum of um, the adjacency matrix. Um, and the spectrum I calculate by solving the characteristic polynomial. Again, this is a concept from, um, from working with matrices in linear algebra. It says that the determinant of lambda times the identity matrix minus the adjacency matrix equals zero. I solve the characteristic polynomial equation. Um, and out comes a set of lambda, which uh, form the spectrum. Um, of the of the network, um, of the spectrum of the adjacency metric. And the neat thing about the spectrum is that it's a network invariant. So it's very useful for classifying uh, networks. Okay. Okay. So here's some examples then um, for of of networks and the various of, and their various properties. So here's a network. Yes. A network on the left here. Um, it's a six node network. I label the nodes one through six in no particular order. And um, the links joining the nodes are called edges. You can see that the that um, at least visually the node three sort of lies in the center of the of the network. So this is what's called a central node. Um, and on the right hand side, you have another network, and it's a slightly more complicated looking network in the sense that nodes one and five um, are connected by multiple um, uh, edges, um, so three edges in particular. Uh, node six has an edge that connects to itself, as does node two. Node three has uh, two uh, edges connecting it to node two. And this is an example of a non simple um, graph. The Adjacency matrices associated to um, these graphs are as follows. Um, and you can see there on the left-hand side, you just have ones and zeros. On the right-hand side, if you're counting edges joining um, nodes, you get higher numbers, so two and three in this case. And another way to think of um, the network on the right-hand side is as a weighted network. So if you imagine squeezing down the edges into a thicker edge, um, between one and five, and a slightly less thick edge um, between two and three, then you, you would find a way to represent um, in terms of this adjac adjacency matrix 
um, the, uh, the, the weighted um, network. Um, and here's an example of the network Laplacian computed for the network on the left. Okay. So all of, the, all of this is basic um, linear algebra, and not particularly exciting about it. Well, there's some other properties which, which are quite useful, especially if we're trying to do physics, uh, if we're trying to extract physics out of these um, networks. One of them is, for example, the path length. So here, the path length counts the number of edges um, that join any uh, two given nodes. So D12 counts the length, the shortest length that, it, uh, that I need to get between nodes uh, one and two, and that's one. Similarly, D13 is two, D12 is four, D15 is um, one, and that counts all of the um, connections between um, node one and two and three and four and five. So then using this, uh, uh, sorry, there's a sixth one as well, and I can calculate that D16 is three. Using this, I can do the obvious thing and calculate the mean distance between node one and any of the other nodes, and you can add up all of these D uh, one J's divide by six, and you get three halves. And I can also do this for the entire network by averaging all the, the mean distances for each of the nodes. And the mean distance for this particular network then is four thirds. Okay, so so far so good. All of these things that we're talking about. Yeah. If I can maybe jump in, sorry. Yes, please, Otto. Um, um, what you have described is very, very similar to uh, Radio Calculus in, in mm -hmm. gravity, if you are familiar with. So Absolutely. My, my question is really, is, is Radio Calculus a special case of this more general way of, uh, or, or the other way around? <laughs> is it equal? Is, 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 is this really? the same as Radio Calculus or, 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 or this is more general? So I would think that, so, so I would think that this is more general and Radio Calculus is not, I wouldn't say it's, it's a special case of, but the way I've always understood Radio Calculus as for example, your, your paper in, 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 in the use of Radio Calculus in the string world sheet is you start off with some continuum space and then you tessellate the space with some, um, some well-prescribed um, blocks, for example, or, or, or or uh, in the two-dimensional case, um, something that will resemble a graph like this. And then you bring to bear the essentially network theory um, on, onto that problem. Right. Mm -hmm. With the key thing there being how you label the edges um, and how you label the, the, the nodes. So in the Regi calculus um, sense, that would be coding gravity in some way. Um, uh, you know, so I guess what loop quantum gravity people call spin foam networks is also this in the same, you know, in, in some way or the other as well, where yeah. you're just labeling the edges through six J symbols and, and you're labeling the nodes in some way. I see, I see. Very good, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so Jeff, I, I just want to pop in here. You know, I've yeah. basically been using network theory for over a decade now to understand problems in supersymmetry. And so uh -huh. I'm very curious to see where you're going to take this next. Right, um, okay. So I'm gonna. Uh, so my interest in this it comes from from scrambling and 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 chaos, and uh, so that's where I'm I'm roughly going. But we're going to make some detours into into virology as well, uh, epidemiology. Um, but I'm happy to come back and 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 see if there's something we can talk about with regards to supersymmetry. Um, okay. So there are a couple of more properties that we need to explore first. Um, so one of them is the idea of um, transit, uh, transitivity and um, another is the idea of clustering in a network. So transitivity is, is a statement about thinking in terms of um, a social network here, where it's, it's really useful to think in this way because in, you know, we have some instinct for what we, what we view as a social network and we all have some experience in, in these large social networks like LinkedIn and Facebook. So I'm gonna phrase things in this way, but keep in mind that it's a lot more general than, than this. So transitivity is the idea of whether the friend of my friend is my friend. Um, so here's the same network we've been looking at and five and three are acquainted with each other. So we could consider them friends because there's a link between the two and three and six are acquainted with each other. So there would be friends. Um, and five would be the friend of my friend uh, if I was, sorry, six would be the friend of my friend if I was five. 
but five and six are not linked to each other. So the friend of my friend is not necessarily my friend. However, the friend of my friend is more likely to be my friend. So this is why if you look at the acquaintance chain in let's say Facebook, you'll notice this phenomenon of where if I, if I have a friend and that friend has a friend, there's a, there's a higher likelihood that that third friend is going to be my friend as well. Not necessarily the case that it, that it will be, but there's a higher likelihood. Paths of length two that are closed in the sense that they form a triangle, um, uh, well, they form a loop. And networks with a large number of loops are what we call highly clustered. So the way to think about this is um, imagine I go back to that picture that I had earlier of the, the map of the world. And I can organize the world um, in terms of countries. And countries are populated by people, and people tend to interact strongly in countries. Um, but you know, until recently, and the advent of um, air travel, um, people in countries wouldn't necessarily interact with people in other countries. Um, and so, what we had was a it was a big world, and to get between places took a lot of energy and a lot of effort and a lot of time. But within countries themselves, people were highly clustered, the network of, of, of population, the population network was a highly clustered um, uh, in countries. Okay, well, we would like to quantify this. And one way you can quantify the clustering in a network is through something called a clustering coefficient. And the clustering coefficient more or less um, counts the number of closed paths of length two, so triangles, um, divided by the number of the total number of paths of length two, so not triangles, but of length two. And there are many ways you can, you can write this just by exploring the common torics of these um, graphs. So six times the number of triangles divided by the number of paths of length uh, two, or three times the number of triangles divided by the number of um, connected triples, um, all of which define the same number. And that number we're gonna call the clustering coefficient. And it measures essentially how clicky a particular um, network is, how, how neighborhood like it, how neighborhood dominated it is. This is going to be an important number um, in what we're going to be um, looking at. Because what we're going to be looking at is what are called small world networks. So this was precisely what was established by Watts and Strogatz in their paper of uh, 1998, and then Duncan Watts and, and, uh, and uh, postdoc of um, Stephen Strogatz. Um, uh, Newman um, developed um, quite a bit in the in the 90s and uh, 2000s, and, and it's and you know but by way of perspective, and this is really what got me, uh, what piqued my interest in this. The Watt Strogatz paper, this two and a half page Nature paper that I that I said, you know, was written in 1998, um, has on the order of 35,000 citations, um, you know, and and. At least in 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 my field in in string theory and and high energy physics, this is really a remarkable number. Um, <clears throat> so let me let me outline then um, what it is we're we're talking about. So suppose I've got some n node network, some n node graph. Okay, we're going to call this a small world graph if it exhibits the two following properties. One is that the typical distance between any two randomly selected nodes in the network scales like the log of the number of points, uh, number of nodes in that network. That's point one. In other words, it's not difficult to get between any two randomly selected nodes in the graph. Okay, that distance just goes like the log of, of, the, uh, of the number of um, nodes in the graph. But, and this is important, there's a large degree of clustering um, in the graph. And this large degree of clustering um, means that it's a very neighborhood dominated um, graph. It's a, it's a very clicky graph. So what you have here is really kind of what we were seeing in that picture of the, of the globe, of the world. In that you had, um, you had a large number of people interacting in countries in a very neighborhood dominated way, lots of clustering, but a small number of those people relative to the number of people in the country are able to travel across the globe 
and so communicate across the globe. And so the typical distance between any two random select, uh, randomly selected nodes in the network is small. So if a network satisfies these two properties, then we'll call it a small world network. Um, and in this sense, small world networks interpolate between the clustering properties of uh, regular graphs that are localizing. Um, in, in other words, if I inject something into this, let's say, population um, like a virus, then it stays put roughly in the neighborhoods um, versus the um, rapid spreading of information in a random network. And what small world networks do is they give you a, a dial to dial between localizing properties and thermalizing properties in some way. And it's a parametric dial, so you can actually tune it. Um, <clears throat> the natural question is, how do I measure the, how small um, a small world is? And the small worldness of a graph um, can be measured in, in a couple of different ways, depending on the questions that you're asking. So one, one, one way of doing this is to compare um, the small world graph to the same graph, except instead of having this interpolating properties, we just make it a random graph. So imagine you take the same nodes arranged in the same way and you randomly connect the nodes, then you produce what's called a random graph or an eddy sherini graph of the same size. Um, and by comparing the graph that you have to the associated edish rainy graph, um, you can define a smallness coefficient. Let's call that sigma. And the smallness coefficient is the ratio of the clustering coefficient of the graph that you have compared to the associated random graph divided by the average length, the graph average length, uh, path length to your graph compared to the associated random graph. So that ratio defines for you a smallness coefficient that for a small world network is a number that's larger than one. The problem with this is that it's very dependent on the network size that you have. So if you have a small, small network, um, then uh, it's very hard to trust um, the system. So classically, it's it's fine. You can, you can certainly define the number and, and sigma is a relatively good measure of let's say populations and the way populations interact because you have a large number of, of sites in your network. But if you're trying to study spin chains, for example, where each node in the network is a, is a, is a spin operator, um, then you're really restricted by um, the computational power that you have at your disposal. And typically you're studying um, systems that are of size 16 or 17 spins or 18 spins. Um, but that kind of order of magnitude and the smallness coefficient becomes a, a, a number that's not so easily trustworthy. Another way to, to characterize the small worldness of the uh, graph is through something called the small world parameter. The small world parameter omega is defined in that way. It's one minus the absolute value of um, the path length of the random graph divided by the path length of the network minus the clustering coefficient divided by um, CL. And the neat thing about this parameter omega is that it, it interpolates between zero for a regular graph and one for a, a small world graph. And so you can see how close to, to, to maximally small world your, your graph is. Small world graphs are not the only type of graphs that exhibit this kind of small world phenomenon. There are another class of um, networks called scale-free networks. Um, and there are a special class of uh, small world networks that are dominated by a large number of hubs. So single nodes that are connected to multiple other nodes. Okay, So it's like a hub in a hub and spoke system. Actually, um, uh, if I remember correctly, downtown Providence is, is uh, the, uh, the, the, the street layout in downtown Providence is in a hub and spoke system. Um, and so you have a single hub connected to multiple um, other nodes. Well, when you have a hub dominated um, network, um, then you have a what's called a scale-free network, and scale-free networks are characterized by a power law distribution of the connectivity of nodes in that. And scale-free networks exhibit a mean path length that is significantly shorter, and, and they scale like the log of log of n. We'll have a little bit to say about scale-free networks in the context of um, uh, vaccine vaccination strategies in a little bit. Okay. So 
let me just tell you what Watson Strogatz did in their paper um, and in which they defined an algorithm for how you start off with a regular graph, um, like you're seeing in the center there. And slowly as you increase the randomness, um, dial through regular to small world to random. And the connectivity of these um, graphs that you're seeing in that picture there is, is really what we mean when we say small world. You can see in the regular graph, you have um, some set of nodes that are connected through let me see, uh, nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor. So that's a next to nearest neighbor interacting um, uh, chain uh, node, one dimensional network. Um, and in the middle there is a small world network where you can see that most of the, most of the nodes certainly interact uh, with their neighbors or their nearest neighbors, uh, sorry, or their nearest neighbors or their next to nearest neighbors. But there's the odd one or two or three of them that can speak to, um, neighbors that are across the network. And on the far right hand side is a random graph or edish rainy graph, in which you can see that the edges are just randomly um, distributed. So the watt strogatz protocol basically says, you start off with an end node lattice with let's say k over two next, uh, k over two nearest neighbors um, interacting. So this would be what we would call a k-local um, graph. And then you visit each node, let's call them ni. Right, And when you visit each node, you iterate through each edge of the node. So fix i, and you iterate through each edge ij, connecting uh, node ni to node nj, that's not the same as ni. And then with some probability p, which is user-defined, you decide how what you want p to be. With that probability p, you erase the edge, and you rewire it by, um, by replacing it with some random um, edge ik. Okay, so again, you visit each node in turn. When you get there, you visit each link in turn. And with some probability p, you rewire the lattice uh, to produce a small world um, graph. And then you can dial up. Um, you can dial up uh, between regular and completely random. And the resulting network is a small world network. And you can see the small world network inherits much of the clustering properties um, from the underlying regular lattice that was there. Um, but it also has some small number of random long range um, interactions, long range connections. Okay. So here's an, here's an example um, where we uh, start off with a um, nearest neighbor interacting. So this is k equals one. Um, so going from left to right increases the, the order of the interaction. So nearest neighbor, next to nearest neighbor, next to next to nearest neighbor. Um, and then as I go from top to bottom, I increase the probability of rewiring. And you can see that the graph gets um, progressively more random as you go from top to bottom and P increases from zero to 0 0.9. What you're seeing in the K equals, let's say four or K equals six, um, regular lattices, so top row, is a large number of triangles. So remember we said that when you have triangles in your network, when your network is, is triangle dominated, then there's highly clustering, um, uh, there's high clustering uh, effects taking place. So if I inject some, if I think of this as some um, population again, and I inject, um, let's say some, some virus into um, the population at a point, it tends to stay in that neighborhood because nobody in that neighborhood is talking to people outside of the, the neighborhood. So there's no interaction outside of a neighborhood. Whereas if you go down the, the, the array here and to the, uh, to the right, you see a random edish rainy graph um, where people in the network are talking to random other people in the network and you have a high degree of um, spreading out of that, um, of that virus for example. Okay, so again, we can calculate the clustering coefficient that measures how clicky the graph is and the path length um, uh, as the average of the shortest geodesic across the, the network. And we can plot these, um, these two numbers um, and I do so on the, the right-hand side. And what you see is the following. As you dialing up on the, on the x-axis there is the probability of rewiring um, and you start off with a graph, um, the, the blue curve there is the, um, the path length. 
um, and you see that the path length is is um, sorry the, the blue curve is the clickiness of the of the graph and the, the orange curve is the path length and the path length drops fairly rapidly um, as you dial up p um, whereas the the amount of um, clickiness or or neighborhood dominatedness of the of the graph stays fairly high until you get to a certain point and then it drops rapidly down from there. So these small world graphs are really a, a, a unique class of graphs that exhibit both these properties, localizing properties as well as thermalizing properties. Um, very good, okay. So like most of us, I was um, stuck at home for a large chunk of 2020 um, with nothing much to do other than read as much as I can. Um, and I started seeing some of the patterns that we were seeing in these in these network um, applications to the SYK model, statistical mechanics, in some of the the um, literature um, on what was happening as this COVID nineteen vi virus spread through the world. And so I started to read up a little bit more about this and, and, and actually it turns out that, that much of the language is the same um, and it's really remarkable. And this set of um, slides are really an aside um, to, my, to, the, to the main talk, but I think it was interesting and it's fairly timely and, and I found it quite interesting at least. Um, so um, I, I'd like to share some of what I learned in, in the last couple of months with you. All right, so Traditional epidemic modeling um, is a vast simplification of much of um, you know, what goes on as viruses spread um, through populations in the sense that um, um, these epidemic model, models don't really care too much about the details of the population, of the biology of what happens when the virus enters um, a person's body, um, how it replicates, uh, how it progresses from there. They tend to, it's a, you know, everything that I'm about to say here is very much in the spherical cow approximation. So we're making broad assumptions and, and trying to learn as much universal facts as we can. Um, so they compartmentalize the population into essentially three or four um, different uh, compartments, right? So let's say we have some population. Um, the traditional epidemic models that, that people have been using at least over the last year or so to apply to COVID um, would compartmentalize the population into susceptible individuals, infectious individuals, and individuals that have been removed um, from this in the sense that they've got the virus, they've got some immunity, um, and they don't count towards spreading the, the virus. Of course, unless you've been um, very much asleep over the last uh, year, um, you realize that the that the COVID um, virus is, is is a lot more complicated than that. And one of the complications is that we don't know how long immunity lasts for, um, or if there is um, full immunity, etc. And so maybe you can catch the virus, um, and you can spread the virus, and you can recover from the virus, but then you can catch it again. In which case, you fall back into the susceptible population. So there's many different variants on, on, on these um, compartmentalized uh, epidemic models. So I'm gonna just focus on, on a couple of them. And one of them, um, we're all familiar from our freshman year um, when we study you know, basic logistic growth and this is what's, what's called the SI model. So here, um, a population is broken up into susceptible individuals and infected individuals. And we just leave it at that. So, so this is uh, uh, you know, one way to model how a rumor spreads in a room. So either you know the rumor or you don't know the rumor. So either you're susceptible, you're yet to hear the rumor, or you're infected, you've already heard the rumor. So um, the number of um, infected individuals we'll call X, um, and it's obviously proportional to the number of individuals um, that are infected, but it's also proportional to the number of susceptible individuals. And the proportionality constant measures the interaction between um, the susceptible individuals and the infected individuals, we'll call that beta. So x dot goes like beta times s times x. Um, and then we'll assume that um, some population either recovers from um, the, the virus, in which case they don't transmit the virus anymore, 
or they die, in which case um, they're removed from the population anyway. So we'll call these individuals um, recovered, uh, sorry, removed. And R dot is then proportional to, is then proportional to X, the number of inf infected individuals with some proportionality constant gamma. And similarly, S dot, the number of the population of susceptible individuals decreases with uh, beta S X. And of course, these are normalized variables. So S plus X plus R must equal to one. So to, to, to get some intuition for what's going on here, let's start by setting gamma equal to zero. If we set gamma equal to zero, then this SIR model, susceptible infected um, or infectious removed model, uh, reduces to an SI model. And I can, you can show that in the SI model, um, the two dynamical equations, S and X equations, um, can be boiled, are effectively the same equation. And I can substitute, I can use the constraint that S plus X equals one to eliminate one of the variables in terms of the other one. And I get a logistic equation, which basically says um, X dot goes like X times one minus X. I can solve that using elementary methods. And I'll find that X of T grows in this um, logistic way. So exponential in the numerator and some constant plus an exponential in the denominator. And the, the thing about um, SI models is that the number of the, the growth of the model always results in an epidemic where the entire population is infected. So this is the logistic curve, we're all well aware, and, it, and you can see that the fraction of infected individuals X grows from zero to one. As long as one individual is infected, you're always going to have all individuals infected. The SIR model is a little bit more complicated, um, but can be solved can be solved as a quadrature. So I can write T as some integral um, uh, over U and from zero to R. Um, but the problem is uh, we can't do this integral exactly, close form. But you can get an idea of what's going on um, by looking at um, various um, special cases. So for example, you could ask what happens at late times with this. And at late times, you find that the number of um, rec removed individuals goes to one minus e to the minus um, beta r over gamma. Um, the point where the two parameters, beta and gamma, um, are equal defines what we call a epidemic uh, threshold. So below this epidemic threshold, beta less than gamma, the virus dies out before it's able to infect the entire population. Above the epidemic threshold, um, you get an epidemic. Um, in the SIR model, this very simple SIR model that, that we've just written down, um, you can also define something called the basic reproduction number. This is the number R naught, which everybody by now is well aware of. And in this model, you can actually calculate R naught um, exactly in close form, and you find that R naught is beta over gamma. So R naught measures the number of individuals um, that a particular infected individuals can then um, infect. And you know, the name of the game is to get um, R um, uh, less than one. So basically go below the epidemic um, threshold. So that's what people talk about. That's what people mean when they talk about um, flattening the curve, et cetera. So there's a couple of things to keep in mind um, with this. So here's, here's the curves for, um, for the SIR model. And these curves are again, um, very familiar to, to um, everyone who's um, been reading the news or watching Facebook for the last year. Um, and you can see that there are three curves here. There's the S curve of susceptible individuals that starts off at one and then decreases. There's the R curve that starts off at zero and then increases. And there's the infected curve, which is the curve that everybody's trying to flatten, um, that grows and then decreases. And one of the things, there's a couple of things to notice here. One is that the number of susceptible individuals, the S population doesn't decrease to zero. So inevitably, there are going to be some individuals that just won't get infected. The R um, curve is the complement of that. And so there are gonna be some individuals, um, so it's not going to completely occupy um, the, the population space because there are some individuals that are, not, that are just not going to catch the, the, the virus. Well, the problem with this SIR continuum differential equation, solve it, plot 
the, the graphs flatten the curve story is that there's an assumption which, um, which we've made, which I haven't really paid much attention to, but if we're honest, really ought to investigate the idea that the population interacts, that these populations interact in a fully mixed way. In other words, in a homogeneous way, everybody randomly interacts with uh, everybody else. Um, or, or the probability of, of individual A interacting with some randomly selected individual B is uniform. Well, realistic populations don't really interact that way. And this is where network theory comes in. So how do we make this a uh, more realistic model of how a virus spreads in a given population? Well, the first thing is um, that we want to drop the axiom the assumption of a uniform probability of interaction. Uniform probability of interactions correspond to a random network. And real social networks are not random. In fact, they exhibit clustering. Two people are more likely to know each other if they have a, con uh, if they have a common acquaintance. We're likely to interact with each other within neighborhoods, within households, um, uh, rather than across the world. Um, which brings to, to, to the fore then some important epidemiologic, epidemiological parameters. And in particular, the parameters of susceptibility, how susceptible is a particular um, population, particular neighborhood, um, to the, a particular age category to the, to the virus. And the other one is the transmissibility of the disease. So as we were just saying before um, the talk started, um, there have been variants to the COVID-19 um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus that were detected, one of which um, was uh, first detected in, in, in South Africa, the other one in the UK. And they have the characteristic that they are more transmissible than the prototype um, SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, virus. Um, and this increased transmissibility means that the virus spreads through the population um, at a far greater rate than um, the original virus. So in South Africa, for example, um, this, is, this is by far the, the more dominant strain um, of the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus um, that's spreading through um, the country. Well, when an epidemic takes place or not, um, in this context of network theory can be mapped to um, a standard problem of percolation in networks. Now, up until this point, I had not really paid much attention to the idea of percolation um, in networks or the idea of percolation in statistical mechanics at all. Um, so this was a novelty for me to, to learn about, and it's a really remarkable piece of mathematical physics, which I think I will share um, with you in, in what is essentially the, the, the initial experiment that, that came up with the concept, and that's by Watson in the paper of Watson and Leith in 1974. So the Watson and Leith experiment worked like this. So imagine you have a wire mesh, okay? And two conducting plates um, on either side of the mesh. For argument's sake, let's, say, let's make it a 137 by 137 um, grid. And you connect to the, connecting to the conducting plates um, um, some power source, like a battery, and something to measure the current. Um, like an ammeter. Okay, so now if I if I turn on if I if I close the circuit, then I expect current to flow because this is a conducting wire mesh across there. And each of the black dots that you're seeing there is a connection between a, a vertical um, piece of wire and a horizontal piece of wire. Um, so then, what uh, Watson and Leaf did is they asked, how does the electricity flow? from the left-hand side of this picture to the right-hand side of the picture. And in particular, what happens if we slowly remove nodes in this rectangular grid? So by remove nodes here, I mean just take a pliers and, 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 and snip the nodes so that you break the connection between the vertical and the horizontal um, uh, wire. So let's do that. So then we remove some nodes and I'm gonna denote that by um, a an open circle. And I'll call phi the, the fraction of the removed nodes. So the ratio of the removed nodes, in this case four, to the total number of uh, nodes. And the total number of nodes is 137 by 137. 
And then I measure um, the, I go and look at the ammeter and I see if there's still a current reading. And yes, there's still a current reading. So current's still finding a path from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So then I do this again, increase the fraction of removed nodes from the network. And then I do it again until I'm not detecting a current flow again. And the smallest value of that fraction phi at which no current flows is what's called the percolation threshold for that network. So at that point, there is no path for the current to, to find to, to go from left to, to right. And percolation doesn't happen. And this is, this, is the, this is the same percolation that we talk about when we talk about your coffee percolating um, in, in the morning. So this is the water um, flowing, finding a path through the beans um, into the cup. OK, so it turns out that you can study epidemics on networks by mapping the problem to a uh, to a problem of percolation, and it's basically um, asking how does the virus find a path through um, the network, and how much of the network can you remove um, by removing the individuals um, uh, and putting them into the R population, with the virus still finding a path through this. Of course, at this point, the problem becomes very difficult to solve. Uh, analytically, and one has to resort to numerics, and um, the numerics are still rather beautiful. Um, in particular, well, they, they 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 kind of back up your intuition um, in a in a very clean way. So the numerical res uh, results that um, that Moore and Newman um, uh, showed in 2000 um, was that epidemics tend to spread more rapidly in highly susceptible populations. So if you have for SARS-CoV-2, for example, if you have an older population, the epidemic spreads more rapidly than if you have a younger population. Um, the amount of time for an epidemic to spread throughout the population is given by the um, average radius of connected clusters of susceptible individuals. Um, so you have connected um, clusters of susceptible individuals and the virus spreads between these connected clusters, these neighborhoods, and just how far in terms of the network path length um, these clusters are um, tells you how fast your virus is going to spread throughout the, um, throughout the population. And the epidemic threshold maps directly to the um, through the to the percolation threshold for the network. And in fact, the infection curve flattens as you increase the percolation threshold. So here's uh, the, the, the graph that you're seeing, that the, sorry, the, the plots that you're seeing there are a flattening of the curve that comes with an increase of um, phi, the, the percolation threshold. Um, and in particular, if phi is less than phi c, um, the critical percolation threshold, then no epidemic outbreak takes place. So then the name of the game in um, preventing epidemics is to try and um, decrease the curve by decreasing phi so that it lies below the, um, the critical value of phi. Well, you can turn this around. You can tell this, this idea of, of information or network or, or, or virus spreading through a population around and ask if you could use these concepts of um, how information flows through a network to halt the spread of a, vac uh, of a, of a virus through a population. In other words, we could try and understand if there are efficient vaccination strategies um, or, or, or if there are strategies, vaccination strategies that are more efficient than other vaccination strategies. So I'm going to change. Um, uh, notation here from phi critical to lambda critical and talk just about the epidemic threshold and not the percolation threshold, but they're, they're, they're related to each other. Um, and this, this, is, this discussion is based on a paper by um, uh, Desho and Barabasi in, in, in 2002. So there they ask the question, what is the, the most effective strategy to halt a viral infection by let's say vaccination? Um, with, the con with, with the constraints that you have a finite size population and you have limited resources. So you only have a certain number of vials of the vaccine, uh, of the vaccine and it's prohibitively expensive to inoculate the entire population because if you inoculate the entire population, then sure, you can eliminate the, the epidemic. But what if you can't? 
how do you go about coming up with a with a um, an efficient strategy for vaccination? Um, well, one general strategy is to try and reduce the spreading rate, and the spreading rate we'll call um, lambda um, of the virus, so that it lies below the epidemic threshold. If the virus is unable to um, uh, so, so the variables nu and delta that I'm, that I'm using here uh, are what we were calling beta and, and gamma um, previously. So if the spreading rate of the virus is less than the epidemic threshold, then the virus will, ev uh, will eventually die out. So you want to try and drive up um, lambda or drive, uh, or drive down, um, uh, sorry, you want to try and drive up lambda, uh, lambda critical, sorry, right? So that the lambda that you're stuck with, the lambda that you have, the spreading rate, um, is less than 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 critical value of the epidemic um, spread rate. So you can actually go ahead and calculate the critical epidemic threshold um, value, and it turns out that in a scale-free network, so a scale-free network. Well, okay, so so more generally then. Um, the value of lambda c is given as the network average of the connectivity um, k of the network to uh, the second moment um, k squared, where, where the network average of um, k to the n, the nth moment, is computed as the integral from m to kc, where m is the smallest connectivity in the network, the smallest um, number of edges in the network, and kc is the um, is the largest in a finite size network, and you integrate k to the n with um, the uh, uh, the probability degree um, uh, through the network. And scale-free networks, these networks that I said were hub dominated, um, so they have a large number of single hubs that are connected to a large number of other nodes. These networks are characterized by a, um, a degree probability that goes like a power law, where that power gamma is a number that's less than or equal to about three. Well, in such networks, in scale-free networks, so highly connected networks with large number of hubs, um, it, you can calculate that um, uh, lambda c, the critical value, um, of the epidemic threshold is zero. So this is a problem because if lambda c is zero, and this is an SIS model, so susceptible individuals get infected and then uh, recover, but are susceptible again, so they can catch the virus again. If lambda c is equal to zero, then lambda is never going to be less than lambda c, and you're stuck with an epidemic any which way you cut it. So one way to overcome this problem um, is to drive up the value of lambda c from zero to some finite value, or some finite value, and then you control what lambda is. So if lambda is less than uh, lambda c, you can ensure that there's no epidemic. One way to drive up lambda c is to bias um, any cure to curing the hubs first. So suppose you have a vaccine, and your strategy is I will inoculate my entire population uniformly. So I just randomly find people in the streets and I inoculate them and I go through the entire country this way. Obviously, this is a prohibitively expensive um, exercise, um, but it's not only prohibitively expensive and inefficient financially, it's also an inefficient way to achieve the same goal um, over time. A better way to do it would be to first cure highly connected parts of the network. So you bias your vaccination strategy towards hubs. So in a scale-free network, you find that lambda c goes from zero to um, k naught minus m. Um, again, k, uh, m is the smallest uh, number of um, the, the smallest value of the connectivity in, in the network, um, divided by k naught m times the log of k naught over m um, to the minus one. When you plot that out, what you find is that um, in this curve down uh, in the middle and bottom of the screen. Um, which plots lambda c as a function of um, of k naught, and k naught is a is a number where you pick the number and then you ensure that all nodes um, with k, uh, the number of uh, edges that emanate from that node, 
greater than uh, that number K0 are immunized and hence kept healthy. What you find is that the more hubs that are immunized, in other words, the smaller the value of K0, the larger the value of the epidemic threshold, lambda C. So you can drive lambda C to higher values and consequently a greater chance of stopping um, an epidemic by immunizing um, a, a larger number of hubs in the, in the network. So this is a, this is a uh, I'm not sure if the word fun is appropriate in this context. This is an interesting way of, appro of um, approaching the problem of how to construct vaccine strategies um, depending on the topology of the network in your population or more social science speak, uh, depending on, on, on the social structure of your population. Anyway, that's, that, was, that was an interesting aside that I, that I found. Um, a lot of the tools and words and math that we were using in studying these networks in, in statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics um, actually fed directly into what was happening in the real world. So back to the problem that we really wanted to study. Um, and this was the idea of quantum small worlds. So Jeff, so we I, wanted to study, Jeff sorry. I, to, uh, yeah. I just want to give you a time check. It's 1.14. Yeah. We've been at roughly an hour. So I just want to make sure you're aware. I am. Um, can I get like five minutes? Oh, absolutely. As I said, I just want to make sure you had a time check. That's all. Good. All right. Good. Okay. So here we want to study the following Hamiltonian. Um, so it's a network. It's a one, it's a one dimensional network um, governed by the Hamiltonian that you see in the yellow box. And, and again, um, my slides are slightly nonlinear, but the thing to focus on is the thing in the yellow boxes. Um, and, I, and then I'll speak around those things. So each vertex in this network, at each vertex in the network is some spin half state. So it's a spin that's, in, that's either up or down and the edges represent a spin exchange between the states on this uh, lattice. So the SKs are related to the um, kth poly spin matrix acting at site I. We code the network topology in some N by N adjacency matrix. Again, it's gonna be a simple network um, so the adjacency matrix is going to consist of either ones or zeros um, if we normalize the couplings. And the point here is that I don't want to care too much about the fact that there are spins, um, the fact that um, there's some physics going on here. I want to take the problem and map it to this mathematics problem and see what we can learn about the physics from the mathematics problem. So here's, here's an example of what said adjacency matrix would look like for a particular network. So the networks on the right hand side, oh, sorry, on the left hand side, um, and it's an 11 node network, um, uh, so 11 sites on this lattice. Um, and as I go from the top to the bottom, um, I go from a next to nearest neighbor um, interacting uh, spin chain to next to next to next to nearest, etc. So it's some K local regular lattice with n equals 11 sites. Right. Um, the adjacency matrix I can code black for one and white for zero, and then you get this crossword looking um, uh, picture of the adjacency matrices. And that's really all that I care about at this point. So I can solve the um, eigenvalue problem by brute force and I can plot the eigenvalue distribution and you can see that on the right hand side. And we're gonna need to say something about that a little later when we, when we randomize the system. Okay, so for nearest neighbor interactions, this is nothing but the XXX Heisenberg spin chain. It's well known, it's well loved, it's integrable. Um, and I can solve the, 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 the system by beta ansatz um, exactly. But even for more general regular couplings, I can still solve the eigenvalue problem because H is, is, a, is an element of GL two to the N by uh, two to the N for complex edges. But that's not what we, what we want to do. What we want to do is implement this watts strogatz protocol. Remember, we visit each site and we randomly rewire the, the lattice. So here's, here's an example of what happens to the adjacency matrix um, as, we, as we do that. And you can see that the adjacency matrix, this crossword looking thing, um, gets more and more um, random looking as I go from the top to the bottom, increasing the rewiring probability from, from 0.1 um, uh, down to 0 0.75, for example. Okay. Um, what's interesting is if, if we go ahead and solve the eigenvalue problem, the eigenvalue distribution looks um, pretty much the same for large K. Um, the spectrum looks pretty close to 
um, that of a regular um, chain. So what we wanted to know was how do these systems scramble information? Scrambling is the tendency of a many body quantum system to delocalize quantum information over all its degrees of freedom. So recently there've, there've been a lot of attention paid to some of these uh, diagnostics for, for uh, scrambling. So one way to diagnose this is by the thermally average commutator squared, which is called C of T. Or equivalently, if we're talking about the commutator of Hermitian operators, then this is um, the same as the um, out of time order correlation function, um, uh, a dagger of t, b of naught, a of t, b of naught, uh, of naught. And so we calculate the OTLC or the square commutator, depending on which is easier to do. And the behavior of these diagnostics tell us how the system is scrambling information. Um, so here's an example um, where we calculate um, with the spin operators the four point function. Um, uh, at beta equals zero, say. Um, so this is the infinite temperature, 4.0 TOC. Um, and this will tell us um, how the system scrambles. Now, another diagnostic is what's called the spectral form factor. And the spectral form factor is just the analytic continuation of the thermal partition function. The neat thing about the spectral form factor is that it exhibits random matrix behavior at late times. So if I take my system and, and it's a chaotic system and I let it evolve in time, eventually, It'll, it'll start to behave like a random matrix theory. The spectral form factor samples some of that random matrix um, behavior, but it behaves like a quantum field theory um, uh, quantity. So it's closer to the OTLC than the usual um, random matrix theory uh, measures. So we did that. And what we did, what you see here in the center of your picture is what happens if you take um, such a chain and you inject some energy at one site and you watch that energy spread out. And we could show that it spreads out in a light cone. That's, that's essentially the Lieb Robinson bound. Um, we calculated the OTOC. And what we found was that these small world systems did not do what we, what my intuition said that they ought to do, which is that you scramble information chaotically. Certainly they scrambled information, but not chaotically um, in the sense that the OTOC didn't grow exponentially, um, but with some power law. So this was an interesting thing because we could, we could, we could essentially dial the randomness of the system so that when we eventually hit P equals zero, you had a transition between this power law growth for the OTOC and an exponential growth that we would expect for a chaotic system. Indeed, the spectral form factor exhibits very similar kind of um, behavior. Um, you, you see a dip, a ramp, and a, and a flat plateau um, that's uh, characteristic of a scrambling um, system. Um, <clears throat> so, Let's see, okay, so I'll take, in fact, I can, I think I can, I can stop here. The rest is some technical stuff on um, random matrix theory and spectral statistics. Yeah, okay, so let me, let me conclude then um, by saying that, um, let me just find my slide. Um, networks are really everywhere, and they're not just for connecting with people on, on, on Facebook. They actually afford us a really powerful, universal way of looking at um, interacting systems. So we applied network theory to, to some of the problems that we were interested in, like, um, like spin chains or the SYK model. Um, and try to see if we could learn similar things as doing standard quantum field theory calculations, but applying the linear algebra that comes with, uh, with um, network theory. Um, however, for, for technical and computational reasons, most of our numerics was restricted to um, small systems. So essentially what we had was um, few body sparse quantum systems. And we're currently trying to apply these to larger values of n, so really many body quantum systems 
that are um, strongly interacting with each other. Um, and I want to conclude with one last point, which is that you know the kinds of systems that I was talking about, the quantum network systems, um, are clearly toy models, and I you know make no pretense that they're that they're not. But what's really interesting and what's emerged over the last couple of years, the last two years or so, is um, some really interesting work by groups in Maryland and, in Sta and at Stanford. Um, uh, Monica Schleier-Schmidt, for example, um, who, who's been doing these cold atom tabletop experiments in cavity QED, um, where you can construct quite similar um, cold atoms in these chains and, and, and using lasers, get them to interact um, in the in the in exactly the kind of ways that we've been um, that we've been talking about. So, so it's a it's a remarkable thing that maybe is is even realizable in 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 a lab. And with that, I'd like to thank you. So, Jeff, can can you stop sharing? Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. as you can see, I hope a number of us have uh, given you the clapping hand uh, designation for that one right. wonderful presentation. Okay, so uh, we've been here over an hour. However, if people have questions and if you're willing to take them, uh, I'd like to proceed. Um, and, and, and since I can't, uh, let me see. Um, David, uh, David, I see you thumbs up. So do you have a question for Jeff? David, you're muted. I think it was just a thumbs up. Oh, okay. Um, so if some, if you have a question, please show me a thumbs up and I will try to make sure that uh, we get a QA and a going here. I, I'm not seeing any thumbs up, Jeff. No worries. So, um, no, thank you. There's one. Oh, there's one. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi. Um, hi. So one of the themes I guess you seem to be drawing on is that, the, is that you have an, uh, intermediate possibilities that are not necessarily easy to realize uh, between uh, extremes, between chaotic and not chaotic, or between the uh, spreading an expected rate or not spreading an expected rate. So, so is the issue for physical realization of networks, uh, what the physical meaning of these intermediate extremes is? Um, you mean in the small world networks? Well, you know, yeah. So, you know, I, in, in a couple of widely different examples, you pointed out that, uh, that, you know, it's things are not connected or not connected. That's not the issue, right? You know, there's a, there's a dot, you can dial up the possibility of spreading going between two extreme um, yeah. with the small world networks. Yeah. And so, the, so is the, is the physical connection that you're inviting us to think about the nature of these, this, in this, uh, physically controllable levels of connectivity? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so that's exactly what I'm what I'm what I'm saying. So you know, you, know you, you look at the world around us, and we live in a small world. Um, it's it's it has these two properties: the mean path between two points on the globe is small, um, and I mean this in a network sense, not in a geographical sense. So the mean path is small. You can connect. You know, I can go between between Cape Town and 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 Providence um, with two flights and a train journey, um, and you know, it's, it's a small path between these two points. But we live in a highly, simultaneously, we live in a highly neighborhood dominated um, uh, world. So you're more likely to interact with your neighbors, with your colleagues at Brown. I'm more likely to interact with my family, with my neighbors, with my colleagues at UCT. But we're still able to communicate across the, the, the world. So we, we actually live in one of these intermediate um, uh, steps. And one way to dial this, you know, so, so I, I kind of really got interested in, 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 in the following question. So very early on, well, early on, um, circa March last year, you know, former President Trump bans flights from, from, from China and, you know, takes lots of credit for, for banning the flights from China. And I wanted to know how useful was, a thing was that? Um, so, so it's useful in the context of not spreading viruses across the world if it takes those two points, the United States and China, and it moves them very far away in the network, okay? So if it does that, then it's a useful thing to do. Well, 
it turns out that, okay, banning flights from China is a useful thing to do, but it actually doesn't take the US and China particularly far away from each other on that network. What would have been better? What would have been more efficient? What would have taken the US and China further out is if he'd shut down hubs. So Dubai, Heathrow, um, JFK, if you shut down a couple of those hubs, the distance between those two points in the network would have increased significantly and significantly more than just shutting down flights from China. And you can prove this mathematically. Yes, so, so my, you know, I guess the, the, the question I was sort of asking is, you know, in a physics context, if you're thinking, you're, you're worried about spin chains or, or quantum mechanical spin lattice problems, you tend to think of the Hamiltonian is is sacred. What I'll do is I'll play with the thermodynamic parameters and see if I understand the properties or understand the yeah. ground state. Yeah. Uh, you're inviting us to say, no, no, play with the Hamiltonian. Yes. And think of, you yes. know, and think of the connectivity of the Hamiltonian in particular ways. Yes. Uh, and I, you know, it's easy to see in the, in the airline network case, it's a little harder to see how you would do it in a magnetic problem in a, in a lattice. Right. So these cold atom experiments are, are, are precisely one of the ways you could do this. You can actually get, you know, you can freeze out all but the spin degrees of freedom in this in this cold atom lattice, um, as I understand the Stanford group is doing, and there's a group in Maryland. There's actually, it's not a group, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a quantum computing company um, that's building its, its, its qubits out of these cold atoms. You can, you can use um, cavity QED in some ways that I'm not being an experimentalist, don't understand yet, but you can, you can use cavity QED to actually make spins interact um, across the network rather than just with nearest neighbors and not just jump across nearest neighbors, but you can make them jump across the entire network. Um, and you can do it in a, in a, in a, in a way that, has, that comes with the dial. So uh, to, I mean, yeah, sorry, go for it. No, no, I, I wanted to give Richard a chance if he had to respond, if he has a response, because I'd like to take this discussion in a different direction. Oh, thank you, thank you, I'm fine. You done, Richard? Okay, so Jeff, thank you very much for this talk. Uh, two of my students are on this, uh, are still with me, and I'm very glad that they, they, uh, this, they were able to attend this. Because as I said to you earlier, I've actually been studying networks. That's what these Adinkra things are that I've been studying since 205. And yep. we've been trying to use them to make progress in understanding fundamental questions about the representation theory of supersymmetry. And you actually gave me a number of ideas during this talk that I'd like to pursue. Maybe we can um, have a, a later Zoom with me and my students and you. Oh. One question I wanted to know is, uh, uh, Mark, are you, are you the one who's holding the recording for this presentation? And will it be posted later? It is being recorded, and my understanding is it will be posted later, yes. Very good, because for actually for my own individual research program, I am going to want to go back and look at parts of this. But Jeff, I want to thank you for this eye-opening talk. Uh, the other thing is, I have a question for you. Uh, yeah. So I've been in communication with, uh, oh my goodness, um, Mathematica, uh, 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 who am I thinking about? Um, Wolfram. Wolfram. Stephen Wolfram. Wolfram, right. right. So yes. Stephen Wolfram and I have been in conversation about, uh, you know, he has this whole thing that he's been doing, trying to uh, look at, at uh, cellular automata, but a lot of it boils down to network theory. And it, in my opinion, what they're doing recently shows some signs of making progress towards physics. So I'm curious as to whether you are watching that at all. So, uh, I have a student who's starting off with me um, uh, this year, uh, and he was an intern with Stephen Wolfram um, over the last year, um, working on, on on that. So he's been kind of filling me on. We're doing something different. We're trying to we're okay. trying to study the um, the we're trying to use neural networks and machine learning to study the the mobility edge in many body um, localization, but. He's he's been filling me in with what he'd done with 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 Wolfram. So he in particular he he was trying to um, study with um, an intern at uh, sorry with a with with somebody at at uh, Mathematica um, how gravity arises from these networks of, of these yeah. cellular automata. Yeah. Okay. Because I you know like I said there's such a huge overlap with network theory. One begins to get suspicious that something very important can possibly emerge. 
Yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's a so so um, Arabasi is 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 in northeastern, and I think the northeastern's put its money on on network theory. So they're building a huge group in network theory there, and they do all sorts of things um, with uh, with with networks. Yep. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions or comments that someone wants to make? Uh, just a quick question, if you don't mind. Uh, go right ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for the nice talk. I just wanted to ask about the Hamiltonian you consider. Uh, you named it XXX Heisenberg spin chain, but I just wonder how physical this Hamiltonian is, because is it just some artificial that you just, you know, define for your purpose, or is it, does it show really a real system? You mean the Heisenberg spin chain? No, the or... one you introduced here, because you have three summations here, and you have this agency matrix, and uh, you know this. Uh, so the, so the agency matrix just basically says that um, that any of the spins can flip with any of the other spins across the across the the chain. So, you know, physically, it, it's not particularly realistic. But the XXX spin chain is a model of the antiferromagnet. Um, so there's a, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty physical. And that's when, that's when the adjacency matrix has um, only one off um, diagonal matrix, uh, diagonal entries. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Esan, for that question. Uh, are there any more questions? Uh, if not, um, uh, I, let's see, I, Mark, you're the host, right? So you'll shut this down, right? I guess so. I think it turns off when we all leave anyway. Okay. Um, okay. Well, um, okay. Very good. Well, again, Jeff, great talk. Great seeing you. Give my regards to Amanda. And uh, like I said, I want to actually, I really do want to talk to you about trying to get some of your expertise. I'll, I'll send you an email. We can, we can make it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to clap in the real world. Anastasia. Thank you very much. It was great to, 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 to speak to you guys. And it's good to see some familiar faces again. And, you know, okay, one day in international travel is a thing again. Okay. Hi, Jeff. Uh, uh, we'll end with this picture again. Is it snowing now? Yes, it is. Oh, yeah, it's coming. It's, it's, uh, see, this is real world. This you know, I live. remember the last, the last big snowstorm I was in was in Providence, and the, the, there was this homeless guy standing outside the Starbucks on Hope Street. On, on, um, uh, you know the Starbucks that we used to go to all the time. And he was, he was like, oh, you people think this is a snowstorm. You should have seen what it was like in 1976. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some of us did see the great storm of 76 in Boston. That's true. Eight, That's right. Right. Okay. It was well, 78, 78, but uh, that's okay. Oh, 78. Yeah, 78 yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay. 78. Okay. Okay. Take care. Nice. Bye. Uh, Thank you, Jeff. Good to see you. Thank you. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you for the nice talk. Thanks.